Welcome. We're glad you found this recorded presentation by the Knox County Master Gardeners. We are a volunteer community service group affiliated with the University of Tennessee, as well as Tennessee State University and their cooperative extension programs. The mission of the Knox County Master Gardener program is to educate and serve the community using research-based information on best practices in horticulture, environmental stewardship, and integrated pest management. One of the ways we educate is through our Speakers Bureau. Hello, this is Erin Sack. And I'm J.D. Burnett. We are Knox County Master Gardeners in East Tennessee, and this is part one of our two-part series on fungi. This portion of the talk will focus on the basic biology, chemistry, and the roles fungi play in ecosystems and in our gardens, as well as basic cultivation and fungal roles. Our next talk will focus on the fruits of practice, and we will expound upon some of the slides that you'll see here. Before then, I have to let you know that this is not an ID course, and further to that, as Master Gardeners, we are not doctors, and we are not recommending that you eat these for any sort of medical conditions. To continue that disclaimer, mushrooms can be dangerous. They are much harder to identify than a lot of plants. Uh, we definitely recommend seeking a professional source for identification purposes, and uh, we'll be providing a couple of resources for that at the end of this talk. You can also join groups if you want to learn more about mycology and mushrooms in general. The closest one to here is the Cumberland Mycological Society. I've provided a link for you down below. Um, but basically, you know, we're not recommending anybody go out in their backyard and just take a bite out of anything that they find. We're helping you to grow some of the more commonly cultivated mushrooms and, and giving you a little bit more basic advice. So as we get started, this is just going to be the basics of fungi. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about fungal evolution. Um, and then we will also be talking a little bit about some of their... Um, various uses in our world. This is the phylogenetic tree of life and it displays the three domains. Each one of these different colors displays a different group of organisms that are characterized by certain elements. Um, we've got bacteria to the left over here, it doesn't really need a ton of explanation and it would take quite a long time to do so. Archaea in the middle, that tends to be your extremophiles. These will be uh, some creatures that live by volcanic vents deep under the ocean. They might um, live around a uh, hot spring in Yellowstone. And then on the right, we have Eukarya. And Eukarya includes humans. We're in the animals collection over here. Um, and so are considered eukaryotes. And fungi are also eukaryotes. You can see that we're actually all on the same little branch over here, animals, fungi, and plants were called macroorganisms. And if you were to zoom in on this little branch, you would see that animals and fungi are actually even closer related to each other than we are to plants. Um, fungi are definitely closer in appearance and behavior to animals than they are to plants in a lot of ways. Um, and actually one of the, the main ways that I've heard to differentiate is that Animals will digest their food on the inside, and fungi digest their food on the outside. So while we use all of our stomach acids to break down different nutrients, um, fungi will actually release various compounds in order to break down their food and then absorb it once it's already digested. Here we have the taxonomic tree on the left. And you can see it starts at the top with the most nonspecific and ends with species, the most specific. Uh, on the right, we've got just a good example of hierarchical classification, um, starting with kingdom and getting down to the species. And you can see there are specific um, word endings for each one of these in order to tell you what someone's talking about if you were to hear this in a, uh, in a bit of text or, or um, in a talk. A lot of the time in the fungi kingdom, you will find that um, 
people do not have common names for a mushroom or for a fungus, and so they will use the Latin rather than any, any common name. And this is a much more frequent with fungi than it is with plants. So it's a good idea to have at least a grasp of how this works. Basically, you start out with the genus. That's usually the uh, capitalized word at the beginning. And then you have the lowercase word, which is the species. And that is how you'll know the difference between this agaricus and the other 500 agaricus out there. There are five fungal phyla, and these are basically just the five main categories of fungus that are out in our world. Um, we're not talking about lichens today. Lichens are actually not specifically fungus. They're a, a symbiotic relationship between uh, usually a fungi and something else. Um, so we're not going to be talking about lichens today, but we start out at the top here with Chytridia micata. These are the chytrids, and these guys are um, pretty fascinating if you were to uh, take a little time to look them up, but we we have so much uh, data already to share with you today. We're, we're not going to get deeply into these. We've also got zygomycota. These are bread molds. Um, this would include your, uh, your penicillin or your amoxicillin. Ascomycota includes yeasts and sac fungi. And then we have basidiomycota. Uh, these are the club fungi and they are 90% of what we'll be discussing today. These are the ones that you would recognize as a mushroom out in the wild. Um, they're the ones where their fruiting body sticks up and creates that nice little cap and, and body for you. Then we have glomeromycota. These are the uh, newly discovered relatively, uh, phyla of fungi that are mutualistic with plants. These are your, when you hear mycorrhizae, mycorrhizal fungi, fungus, that's a uh, glomeromycota. A couple of fun facts. So we said that yeasts are fungi. Yeasts are used to make bread, beer, and wine, so they are critically important in the world. Um, You've also got molds, which are fungi. Without fungi, you wouldn't have any cheeses. Uh, these are uh, also used to make various uh, other food products. About 420 million years ago, there was a fungus in the world that could max out at 26 feet tall. That is Prototaxides. And you can look up some really interesting articles on this particular mushroom. They uh, apparently originally thought it was a tree, and who could really blame them, but um, further study on it proved that it was actually a fungus. The largest mushroom in the world today is nearly 2,500 acres wide. It doesn't actually get tall, but it spreads out. It's actually a honey mushroom that lives in Oregon, and it's a parasitic mushroom, at least as we think of parasitic today, um, although there is some argument with that since it's been in place for quite a long time and the forest that it lives in hasn't been totally destroyed. Let's touch on some basic biology of a mushroom. In picture one on the left, you will see up in the top the reproductive structure. This is the mushroom body that we're all very used to. This is actually the, again, reproductive structure, the reproductive organ, and that is what will release spores. Those spores are how mushrooms reproduce sexually, but mushrooms can also reproduce asexually by cloning. The mycelium, or hyphae, you can see in picture two there. Um, if you've ever been digging through your garden soil or some wood chips, you've probably found this white stringy uh, mycelium. Not all mushrooms have this white mycelium. Some of them are brown rot, some of them are black rot. Some of them you might, might just not see orange, I think is another color. But back to the cloning ability. What is so amazing about these mushrooms is that they are totipleurent, meaning one cell can make hundreds, maybe thousands of different cells versus whereas most human cells or stem cells from humans are pluripotent, meaning they can only make a, a small handful of different cells. It's also worth noting, and we'll talk about this as we continue on, the animal-like behaviors of mushrooms. They respirate, they eat, they do all sorts of things that we would normally attribute 
humans or animals too. <clears throat> Maybe the way that you know mushrooms best is through medicine. We derive most of our medications from fungi. You're probably most familiar with penicillin and amoxicillin. It's actually interesting that I forget if it was World War One or two, but there was a, a, a trade problem between the United States and Germany, and we could not get what at that time was considered the world's sample of penicillin. So the researchers here in the United States needed to come up with their own strain of penicillin or at least sample it so that they could test it on some things. The story I heard was that it was growing on a cantaloupe in the staff kitchen and they isolated it from that and ironically they found that it was much more potent and active against some of the diseases that we use penicillin for today. I want to also mention some other ones that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, I am not very good at my Latin pronunciation, so I, rather than try and give you some garbledygook and what a lot of other people do, is chaga, for example, will be listed as I-O. Reishi might be listed as G-L, lion's mane is H-E, turkey tail is T-B. So chaga, it has really strong antiviral capabilities, even shows effectivity against herpes simplex virus, HIV. It's, it's very potent. Reishi, another powerhouse. I believe there are something like 400 compounds that they extract or derive from this mushroom that have pharmacological benefit. This is really commonly used as an anti-carcinogen. If you're uh, doing some sort of chemo treatment or experience radiation, it's shown helpful, helpfulness there. It's also a great liver tonic. Reishi, at one point in time in ancient China, a commoner would have been blinded for looking at this or put to death for touching it because this mushroom was such revered and only reserved for the king. Lion's mane, probably one of my favorites. It is currently being researched for uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. They have created drugs from it um, to treat neuropathy. It helps stimulate nerve growth factor and it remyelinates the sheath of your neurons. And finally, turkey tail mushroom. This one has shown really great effect uh, against breast cancer. Paul Stamets has a great TED talk where he actually talks about his mother being treated for breast cancer with this turkey tail extract. Um, what they're extracting is commonly called PSK. I believe that they may also extract PSA. And PSK is our number one anti-cancer drug that, that they prescribe. The list goes on. You'll see in our references, the Mycobenicitals book and mushroomreferences.com. I just want to mention that this mushroomreferences.com is run by Paul Stamets and it is very accredited and good source. Uh, briefly here, um, I just wanted to talk a bit about some commonly grown mushrooms just to give you an idea of the, the width and breadth of what you can grow for yourself in your own garden or in your own home. There's a wide variety of mushrooms that are far easier to cultivate than you might imagine. Uh, and I've got these nicely numbered so that we can go through them. I'm going to give you the common name and the Latin just to keep up with a good practice, a good habit. And um, because one of these is uh, particularly interesting to do with the Latin. We're going to start out here at number one. This is Portobello, and doesn't that look delicious? Um, this is Agaricus bisporus. It is widely used uh, in fancy restaurants and in homes throughout the U.S. We've also got number two, that's an oyster mushroom. This one's actually specifically a pearl oyster. There's a lot of different kinds of oyster mushrooms out there and they are a fantastic beginner mushroom. They're super simple to grow. They come in a huge variety of colors so you could actually get you a rainbow of oysters if you wanted to. That also makes it a pretty good starter set for uh, children if you are interested in uh, teaching them a little bit more about mycology and mushrooms in general. Uh, 
Number three is, oh, I'm sorry, that was Pleurotus ostriatus for oyster. Number three is the button mushroom. And this is actually a, a little bit of a joke on us. The button mushroom is just an immature portobello mushroom. So three and one are the same Latin name. This is Agaricus bisphorus again. Number four is lion's mane. Um, which JD spoke a little bit about already. It has those strong neurological benefits. Uh, one fun thing about lion's mane is it actually tastes quite a bit like lobster, at least uh, to a lot of people. Uh, so very popular culinarily. You can find this uh, you know, often enough at uh, farmer's markets. And it's a lot of fun because sometimes you'll be out hiking in the Smokies or somewhere and you'll come across just this white pom-pom looking thing hanging off of a tree and that's lion's mane. It is Hericium arenaceus. Number five is shiitake which a lot of us have probably had in, in various dishes. It's pretty popular in a lot of different cuisines. Uh, Lentinula edodes is the name for shiitake. This is also a very easy one to cultivate for beginners because it is uh, particularly popular and easy to grow in log cultivation. Number six is anoki. This is extremely popular in Asian cuisine. The Latin is flamulina velutipis. Um, I've actually had this used in ramen around town at a restaurant and it was absolutely delicious. It's got a really interesting texture because of all those little pins coming off. Um, and I would definitely recommend any, anybody that wants to try that out, give it a, give it a whirl. Number seven is chicken of the woods. And this one isn't necessarily grown so much as it is um, pretty widely distributed. You'll, you'll find it pretty frequently mentioned in um, mycological forums. And it is pretty recognizable. There's a couple of lookalikes, so you do still, of course, want to practice the great habit of uh, seeking professional sources. But you can tell it's got this beautiful fan pattern to it, that bright, bright orange color. The Latin for it is Latoporus sulfureus. And this one is actually uh, in its uh, flushing period right now. So you may even see some out while you're walking in the woods in Tennessee. The genius of mushrooms. So we're gonna look at two, two things that I find pretty amazing about mushrooms. If you notice this graph here on the left, it's, it's a map actually of Tokyo. Uh, you notice that you've got zero hour, five hour, eight hour, 11, 16, and 26. This orange yellow dot in the middle, that's a slime mold. Uh, the name is escaping me for, for what it is. Doesn't actually matter that much. And then these little white spots, these are all neutrified grains. They have been set up in relative location to mimic the Tokyo rail system. So you can see this, this orange area is their central hub. So as the central hub of the slime mold begins spreading out, you see it over here on this uh, D 11 hour column, it's, it's almost covered everything. And by 16 hours, we're at 99% coverage. By 26 hours, not only has it completely covered the entire petri dish that this is in, it's also begun to restructure and reorganize its pathways. You'll notice that up here at the top. What was interesting was that as the slime mold was restructuring itself, it was increasing the efficiency of its own nutrient transport. So it could move these nutrients from, from where its source of food was all the way out to its growth tips or growing area. Well, the Tokyo researchers thought that this was really fascinating and they saw a parallel between nutrient transportation and the transportation of people. When they redesigned the railway system, they were able to increase its efficiency by 300%. That's wild. Biomimicry, learning lessons from nature and applying them to real world, real engineering, real applications. Number two, uh, we normally give this talk in person, so I'm able to kind of ask how many people recognize this thing, but I can't do that right now. And I have to assume that you're all Trekkies. You all love Star Trek. This big blue thing is from the new 
newest version of Star Trek, and it is called the Spore Drive. This was the creative content and input from Paul Stamets, the <clears throat> directors and producers of this newest Star Trek decided to um, reach out to some people to help influence their science fiction. And he said that he would be happy to do so, so long as they stuck as close to the science as possible. Since you're all Trekkies, you know that a lot of the technology from Star Trek has made it into our real world. Certainly, we're not able to transport people across space-time or beam them up and down, but uh, we, we do have things like cell phones and some of our medical treatments that have actually been inspired through the science fiction of Star Trek. So these next couple of slides are things that we're really, really going to hammer down on and focus on in part two, Mushrooms, Fruits of Practice. You might get tired of me saying in talk two here in the next little bit, but I needed to mention these. Liquid cultures are very incredible. They are a perfect example of this totipleurency in action. They also show antifragility in action. Whenever you take these little bits of mycelium, you put them into this liquid culture, they actually need to be stirred and broken up regularly, and that will actually make them grow faster. In this image, you will see some mushrooms, and then underneath them, you see what looks like a white block. That white block, that's all the mycelium, it's totally colonized its substrate. It's also wrapped in plastic. So these are plastic bags that people have put sawdust or other nutrified grains into. And it's a great way to grow mushrooms for beginners. You typically, if you're buying a mushroom kit, it's something like this. Then again, there is, this is also one of the most popular ways for commercial mushroom growers to scale their operations. Next, and this one is going to be a major focus of talk to, is log inoculation. You may recognize the mushrooms in this picture as shiitake mushrooms. They are, uh, that translates actually as oak mushroom. So shiitake grow well on oak, spoiler alert. These are great for beginners, and we will really dive deeper in our next talk. I just want to mention, I want you all to succeed. I want you to not be mycophobic and afraid of, of mushrooms. So just know that store-bought is fine. You can buy kits. You can buy gourmet mushrooms. You can buy medicinal mushrooms. I mean, heck, they sell dried mushrooms on Amazon. And we will now dig a little bit deeper and look at fungi's role in the garden as well as the ecosystem. This chart is from a mushroom catalog where they sell different mycelium and substrates, inoculants, that sort of thing. They want to see you succeed, so they include this kind of information. This is uh, specifically talking about the wine cap or the garden giant, uh, also known as Strafaria. This is a really great mushroom if you want to grow in soil or alongside your summer vegetables. Like I said, we will go in deeper depth on this in talk two, but I did want to mention it in case you're not going to check out talk two. You can take a picture of this and get good information. Sorry, I jumped the gun a little bit on that one. This is the dark side of fungi in the garden. Uh, pathogenic fungus is rampant in East Tennessee. This area is uh, very moist. We get a lot of rain. We get a lot of humidity, especially in the summer, like right now. And so this is the time of year when you do tend to see quite a lot of pathogenic fungus. Um, there's over 8,000 documented types in the world, and I mean, that's just what's documented. There's still plenty for us to learn about. I've got about just, just this handful of some very common problem fun, fungi that you'll run into in your garden, and we're going to start out with one and end at five. Number one, up in the top right corner, 
this is one that I became familiar with this last growing season because it took out some of our industrial hemp plants. I've now seen it this season attacking tomato plants, pepper plants, and even a rose of Sharon. This pathogenic fungi is what we know as southern summer blight. There's currently no known treatment or remedy. However, if you are irrigating your beds, tur turning down your irrigation during the hottest parts of summer, if and when you can, will help eliminate this pathogenic fungi from wreaking so much havoc. Number two, right below it, is septoria. This is a leaf spot disease. It's actually really easy to remedy this one. You just need to cover your soil. As raindrops come down, they hit the soil, that microorganism splashes up from the soil and lands on the leaf. You can do this with plastic. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. You could use paper. Even something as simple as a cover crop, a green manure will help prevent that. Number three is one that, of course, tomato farmers look for in fear. This is anthracnose, and you can tell that it's definitely a problem because this can affect any part of the plant, but it can absolutely destroy fruit crops. It creates these nasty, soggy spots all over your fruit, and it's got that darker center, which will actually develop these kind of pinkish spores if it goes on long enough so that the fun fungus can reproduce. Um, Anthracnose, unfortunately, is a, is a pretty nasty issue. There's a couple of ways that you can mitigate it, but um, mainly the, one of the best ways to take care of it, because this fungus overwinters in soil, rotating your crops is absolutely critical to making sure that this pathogen doesn't make a continuing home in your garden. You can also help your plants by keeping fruit off the soil. I know a lot of us get big, fully fruited tomato crops and those fruits will actually start to drag the ground. If you can crop them up off the ground, if you stake your tomatoes, that'll help with this problem. It is also very helpful to water from the base, which any gardener knows you, you should do that anyway. Try not to water over top of your plants. It can, it can cause a lot of trouble with fungus. Uh, number four, is damping off. And this one, I'm actually, uh, this was the very first time that I came in contact with a fungal problem in my garden. I lost an entire tray of seedlings to this and at the time had no idea what it was. Um, you can see what the, the symptoms are. Is Basically, you get your seedling and it, it pops up and then it just seems to pinch off at the very base and falls over and dies. You can help with this by practicing good hygiene. You, you clean your tools and your hands, especially if you've been using your tools on other plants, uh, that can help. You can also make sure that you're using appropriate seed starting medium that drains well, because any kind of standing water, uh, lingering moisture in your um, seed trays can create this problem. It also is very helpful to make sure that your lighting is very good for your seed trays and that, of course that you avoid overwatering. Number five is cedar apple rust and this one is, is a, just a great example of how diverse fungi can be. You can see this little alien looking orange tentacle monster hanging off of this cedar branch here. Um, this does affect apples and cedars, and so it's a, a bit of a nightmare for farmers who are looking to uh, make a profit off of their crops. It affects the cedar tree with these galls, and they can become so full and heavy with these galls that it actually looks like they've been decorated for Christmas from further away. And then on apple trees, it'll develop these rusty kind of yellow-orange spots all over the tree, all over the foliage and the fruit. And it rarely kills trees, but it does make for a, a, a lower fruit um, uh, development. And there's not a ton of ways to treat it because the problem is so well established. We have so many wild cedars and wild apple trees. And as long as they're within a, a mile or two of each other, there's the chance that the infection, the infection can spread through the spores.
<clears throat> we are going to cover a lot of information in this slide. This is an ode to mycorrhizae, the good microrelationship, mutualistic relationships, and more. In the top right corner, you'll see two images of a corn plant, one with all this white fuzzy stuff at the roots, and then one without it. The one without it on the, the left, that corn plant on the left, this is not been inoculated with mycorrhizae, whereas the one on the right has been. What they're representing here is that the one with mycorrhizae has a bigger root system. That bigger root system is able to gather nutrients, support a bigger plant, get a bigger yield. So you might wonder what exactly what, what are all the features? So I, I've mentioned that they gather more nutrients. They also assist in pest signaling. I'm, I know many of you, that smell of freshly mown grass, that is actually grass producing a bitter compound. What's fascinating is that grass that has been cut, that is connected with another grass that's through a mycorrhizal relationship, will begin creating and amping up those same bitter compounds before it ever gets cut. So there's a signaling and a communication system that, that mycorrhizae provides. It even might, as, as far as we know, go between species. There are two types of mycorrhizae. We have endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae. So endo meaning in, ecto meaning outside. And yes, endomycorrhizae will go in between the cells of the plant and colonize some of the living tissue with inside the plant. You might think that that's bad, but oftentimes this is how some of these fungi provide an immune system to the plant. They are able to produce compounds quickly right where they're needed. Some of the mycorrhizal relationships that you might want to try and cultivate yourself Garden Strafaria, the garden giant, it, it grows great in our summer crops. It establishes a relationship with many of them, such as corn, tomatoes, peppers, okra. One for your brassicas is called the elm oyster mushroom. And this is really neat because for the longest time, and, and maybe only in the last 10 years, they thought the brassicas could not establish a mycorrhizal relationship. Well, we found out that they can, and science has further told us that they might have some relationships with endophytes. We'll talk a little bit more about those just here in a second. I also want to mention for all you blueberry growers out there, the Aracord mycorrhizae. One study that they did, they actually took a, a very alkaline soil they inoculated, they planted blueberries and they inoculated these blueberry roots with a certain aircord mycorrhizae. That mycorrhizae was able to do chemistry on the geology and adjust the soil so that it was beneficial for the blueberries. They had higher yields with these blueberry crops than most blueberry farmers do. Something you definitely wanna look into if you grow blueberries. I mentioned the endophytes a moment ago. There is a lot of debate on the classification of these things. Um, their genetic diversity would lend them to the fungal kingdom or queendom, and their size and some of their other attributes lend them more into the bacterial kingdom. We do know that certain fungi have these endophytic stages, pearl oyster being one of them, they have found it in this endophytic stage where it will be on the surface of the plant and it will help provide an immune system through something called the competitive exclusion principle. Think about it, if you've got a lot of quote unquote good guys living in a neighborhood, it's hard for quote unquote bad guys to move into a neighborhood. Well, this same pearl oyster will grow th go through its life cycle and eventually become a saprophyte. So saprophytes are a type of mushroom that eat the sap wood inside of trees, inside of carbon-heavy lignin structures. So it begins to, you, you look at this and you begin to wonder, wait a minute, this fungi, the same one fungi, provided an immune system, helped this plan out, made a big, strong, giant tree of the forest, 
and then in old age, it began to eat it. Well, that's kind of odd. Or, it, again, is this an animal-like behavior of, of fungi farming, or is it just mutual benefit for both species? We're not entirely sure. They also engage on horizontal gene transfer, and this is genetic modification in nature. This is how genes are passed from one species to another. It's really fascinating, and it is how, I believe it was yeast, they carry more genes from other species than they do of their own. And I wanna to touch on how some of this is, is so amazing and so, so beneficial. I didn't wanna put physics into the uh, description of this talk, but the, because these things are so small, they're able to harness a particle wave function. So anybody that, that knows much about physics, you've got Newtonian or classical physics, and then you've got particle physics. So this particle physics, it can, it can do a lot of things. You all may remember enzymes from, um, I'm sorry about that. I had a little bit of technical difficulty. We were talking about the physics and how enzymes are able to speed up reactions through physics, through math. So the classical or Newtonian physics, enzymes, it, it just couldn't do it in the amount of time that it's given. Whereas with the particle wave function, it's able to solve for variables across space time. It's able to look for different solutions for different problems and produce them very, very quickly. All right, we are nearing the end of our talk. But I wanted to share this particular image because I think it, it really encapsulates a, a part of the fungal community that we don't often get to see. This is one of the best images of uh, fungal hunting behavior that I have seen in, in my time. Uh, it was actually presented at an organic master gardeners class a few years ago. So what you're seeing in this image, this is a, a microscopic image, but this fat worm looking critter here, this is a, a harmful nematode. And what you see beneath it, this whole white field and then the extending little tendril is all a mycelium. So this, this mycelium is extending a hyphae that is capturing the nematodes so that the fungus can consume it as food. And in that way, this fungus has a mutualistic relationship with the tree, pro probably the tree's roots that they're living under, and is protecting the tree simultaneously from these harmful nematodes. So this just really goes to bring home the point that if your garden has a healthy population of beneficial fungi, they can crowd out and actually police the bad fungi in the soil. We've got some great resources for you here at the end of the talk. I've got a number of different links. We've got uh, Everything Mushrooms, which is uh, Paul Stamets. Uh, I'm sorry, not Paul Stamets. It's... Uh, it's a local, I'm sorry, this, yeah. Um, and then we also have some other options here for online resources and some great literature for you to look at as well. We've got several uh, pieces from Paul Stamets, who you probably guessed by now we're great fans of. And we've also got books from Trad Cotter and uh, Peter McCoy. I want to thank you very much for uh, coming to our talk, such as it is, and uh, I hope that you all find great success in your mushroom growing endeavors. Look forward to seeing you in talk number two. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and that you learned something that will help you in your gardening endeavors. Whether that means more blooms on your flowers and ornamental shrubs, attracting more pollinators to your garden, or improving your vegetable production. As we were not able to field your questions today, we want to close by offering you some ways to reach us. 
As you can see on this slide, we have a presence on Facebook. You may post questions to either of these Facebook pages. Feel free to upload a photo, especially if it helps to describe the problem you have. If you are not a Facebook user, you may call the Extension Office at 865-215-2340 and leave a detailed message with your question. Your question will be forwarded to a Master Gardener to research and respond to you. You may also send an email to Ryland Thompson, the Knox County Extension agent who advises the local Master Gardener program. If a photo would help to describe the problem, feel free to attach one or two. Try to keep the total attachments to less than five megabytes. You may get a response directly from Ryland, or he may route your question to a Master Gardener to research and respond to you. We are eager to return to public presentations. In the meantime, you can watch any of our recorded presentations by going to our website, finding a Speakers Bureau event on the calendar, and clicking on the link that is included within the event details. Now, let's go get some dirt under our fingernails. <laughs>